Next, we're going to hear from Gulbarg Rekab Talai, um, who will be presenting a paper titled Alternate Visions of Cinematic Modernity, Iranian Cinema Through Nafisi's Lens. Good afternoon, everyone. First of all, um, I wanted to thank everyone at the Middle East and North African Studies at Northwestern for organizing this event, um, especially Danny and Rebecca and all the others. Um, thank you so much for your hard work. Um, it's an honor to be among such great scholars, um, and it's also uh, my great pleasure to be celebrating Hamid's uh, career and legacy with you all here. Um, maybe I should just make a note. Um, I had uh, I experienced a moment of uh, fear of uh, missing out <laughs> for not having a PowerPoint presentation. So during lunch hour, I put a PowerPoint presentation together. So my apologies in advance if it's kind of uh, you know not great. <laughs> in the year 2010, I attended my first graduate conference in Chicago as a PhD student. Accompanying my then PhD advisor, Mohammad Tawakuli Tariqi and Nariman uh, Safavi, on the last day of the conference, we ran into Hamid Nafisi on the street by chance. And I, I'm sure you don't remember that day, but I do. <laughs> Um, of course, I was already familiar with Hamid, and I felt a bit starstruck when I first saw him. Upon hearing about my project on Iranian cinema of pre-revolutionary Iran, Hamid unassumingly said something about a project that he had been working on for 37 years. A project, he mumbled, that was to be published soon. 37 years. He must be kidding, I thought. After all, there are scholars who have these lifelong projects that usually don't get published. To my surprise, however, next year, the, in 2011, the first two volumes of Hamid's A Social History of Iranian Cinema were published. Great, I thought. Now I had to read another 700 pages. And these were just the first two volumes. I had already invested two years of my graduate studies reading the literature in the field, gathering a large number of primary sources that dealt with the history of cinema in Iran, and writing the first chapter of my dissertation. Encountering Hamid's impressive work on the totality of Iranian cinema intimidated me. First of all, being a delusional graduate student, like most graduate students are, I thought I was going to make great strides in revisionist histories of Iranian cinema. After seeing the colossal volume of his work and the framework of his project, I immediately realized that Hamid had already established a revisionist history. And this is, of course, in addition to his work on um, accented cinema, um, and all the, the works that, ha uh, that my colleagues have been talking about um, in, in this uh, conference. In a way, I think we all agree that Hamid divided the field of Iranian cinema into a pre-social history of Iranian cinema and a post-social history of Iranian cinema. In his unprecedented four volumes, he unpacks the many histories, genres, moments, and texts that define Iranian cinema. Um, I have to admit that I had many Amy moments uh, when, I was, when I was reading uh, Hamid's history because um, everything that I wanted to work on, of course, uh, when I looked at Hamid's book, it was already there. So um, there was nothing new. <laughs> As a graduate student with an ambitious project that spanned almost 80 years of cinema in pre-revolutionary era, all I could do now was to continue my work on cinematic modernity as a historian, which kind of set my project apart from that of the giant of Iranian cinema. And I was fortunate enough to have Hamid as my external examiner. And uh, my defense was a very interesting uh, defense, I must say. Hamid's social account of cinema provided a concrete interdisciplinary foundation to build my scholarship on. I took films as primary sources to look into the past of Iran, 
and to investigate culture in light of global exchanges and interactions. A critical engagement with Hamid's work with a few points of departure presented me an opportunity to offer a new reading of the literature. For one, the history of cinema in Iran has been overshadowed by a grand narrative of political history that disregards the shifts specific to the field of culture. This focus on political history stems from Iran's geopolitical position and its implication in international politics throughout the modern period. Such an over-determining political history, symptomatic of a homogeneous historical time, <clears throat> to borrow from Benjamin, collapses the continuities and discontinuities in the histories of cinema, theater, literature, music, and other cultural spheres, as it provides a strictly political interpretation of the past. Decoupling this political grand narrative from multiple layers, layers of historical time reveals a range of creative cultural activities inside and outside Iran that have had long-lasting impacts on culture and society. Nafisi's interdisciplinary scholarship is such a study as he diverts from conventional histories of cinema and advances a social history that attends to the lives, cultures, societal circumstances, and political conditions that facilitated cinematic modernity, film production, and a movie-going culture in modern Iran. Until Nafisi, most film scholars, save for Negar Mutahede, had uh, started their studies of Iranian cinema with the first Iranian film productions of the 1930s. The period from 1900 to 1930, which entailed an intense engagement with cinema and photography in major cities, was commonly dismissed as part of colonial or imperial, uh, imperialist projects. Nafisi, however, showed us otherwise. For its unique position as an offspring of a new time and facilitator of modernity, cinema has been an indispensable part of modern life since the late 19th and early 20th centuries. Its emergence within the conditions of urbanity enabled the formation of spaces where global images, ideas, and peoples were in constant motion and change. In registering contemporary events from 1900s to 1930s, cinema captured the future's past and prompted future aspirations. So who was responsible for the advent of this technology in Iran? As we move past examining cinema in the private quarters of the Qajar court and move towards a public history of cinema, we see Nafisi's liminal middlemen, uh, or uh, what I call cosmopolitans of early 20th century. Tra trendsetters such as Rusi Khan, Sahaf Bashi, Agayov, and Ardashes Badmagaryan, who laid the foundation for the establishment of the first movie theaters in Tehran at least. Nafisi's call to examine cracks and fissures of social formations urged me to investigate the creative labor of these cosmopolitans further. Indeed, an interdisciplinary, interdisciplinary look at the pursuits of these cosmopolitan middlemen reveal a rigorous engagement with cultural milieus such as photography, reading rooms, conferences, and publishing, which connected the local to global and shaped a heterogeneous modern culture in the early 20th century. Probing into changes that took place in these interstitial places uh, or spaces, uh, to use Nafisi's words, proved to me that the experience of modernity was not belated, nor was it Western. Modernity was experienced through an encounter with unprecedented societal changes brought about by the building of movie houses in urban areas, film spectatorship, um, hearing and engaging in conversations about films, and commingling in spaces of um, uh, movie houses or film screening venues. By virtue of their engagement with cinema, these cosmopolitan middlemen situated Iran as a contemporary of its 20th century, uh, century counterparts. 
It is due to the significance of the work of these cinema pioneers and Nafisi's uh, scholarship that historians such as my good friend and colleague, Blake Atwood, now speak of cinema in Iran rather than Iranian cinema, meaning in this context that the lack of fictional film production during uh, the first three decades of the 20th century does not indicate a lack of cinematic activities. A critical look into these interstitial spaces also unsettles long-held beliefs about the relationship between religion and cinema in its early phases and offers alternative perspectives. As Nafisi argues, film elicited a plethora of reactions from religious and secular thinkers of the time. But there is little proof that there were uh, there was a concerted effort on the part of the Shi'i establishment to confront and ban cinema. The film adverts of some of the early public film programs show us that uh, film screenings took place during the month of Ramadan without the kind of public protest that would make it to newspapers. Very few scholars, again, save for Nagar Mutahedeh, had critically studied, studied spectatorship in, uh, in Iran in the first few decades of cin uh, cinema in Iran. But now we are more than ever exploring how visions of the other in film, what Nafisi calls a cinematic mirror, informed the Iranian national self in the first decades of the 20th century. Uh, and every time I think about this cinematic mirror, I can't um, help but think about um, Mahmal Bof's film, Nasiruddin Shah, the cinema actor, the 1992 film. Global lifestyles, norms, and cultures became reference points against which Iranians defined themselves, a process that Nafisi calls hailing and haggling with films that allowed for spectators to consume and produce meanings. However, it would be too simplistic to consider this self-refashioning to have been against the West. Um, Rather, in line with what Tavakoli Tarri argues and also what my esteemed colleague uh, Simran uh, argued today, this refashioning consisted of contentious negotiations that were in dialogue with local, regional, and international developments. By virtue of their professions and hybrid identities, cosmopolitans acted as nodes, or I'm gonna borrow that lol from uh, Mike's lecture last night, in these negotiations. While cinema and the heterotopic multiverse it offered through films situated Iranians as participants of the 20th century. These nodal connections enabled Iranian subjects to imagine the futural nation as sovereign, war-free, socially moral, and advanced. Cinema soon seized on film's potential for mass mediation and public education. In the absence of Iranian film productions, uh, Persian language films, they, uh, cosmopolitans employed international fiction and non-fiction films as didactic mediums in the service of national identity and advancement. Far from being a response to the religious establishment's criticisms of cinema, such promotion of cinema was in line with nationalist sentiments of the time. In fact, focusing on cinema's moralizing and educational qualities legitimized cinema in very precarious times. Films were promoted in school programs. Uh, sorry. In, uh, films were promoted in school programs, conferences, and charity events. Discounted cinema tickets were issued for students as means for their uplift and instruction in science and history. The acceptance, adoption, and usage of cinema further advanced a film-going culture. Drawing on extraordinary interviews and rare pub unpublished sources, Nafisi skillfully shows glimpses into exhibition and reception practices during cinema's early years that established a film-going culture, therefore opening uh, avenues for new research into spectatorship and exhibition rituals. Once accepted for its didactic qualities, cinema became a means to express nationalist sentiments while generating profits. 
let's not forget that these activities also validated hybrid identities as national subjects during a time when nationalist sentiments were at their peak. The next natural step was to make artisanal national films. And so the first film productions were underway in the 1920s and early 1930s. With the making of these Persian language films, cinema became a forum for registering and projecting aspirations for sovereignty or expressing nationalist sentiments. Ovanes Ohanians, an Armenian immigrant from Soviet Russia who who was one of the pioneers of filmmaking in Iran, specifically wrote about his desire for the making of a national cinema based on national subjects that nurtured moral capital. His suggestions included subjects such as the life of Hakim Omar Khayyam, the 1921 coup d'etat, Ferdowsi's life, Rostam and Sohrab, Shah Abbas, Khosra and Shirin, and stories relating to the time of Nader Shah of Afshar. His, his films, such as Mr. Haji, the cinema actor, were not nationalist, but informed by local traditions and the changes taking place in urban climates. Many of the suggestions that Ohanians made were interestingly then taken up by Abdul Hussein Sepanta in collaboration, of course, with Ardashir Irani. An Iranian poet, actor, and director, Sepanto was implicated in the making of more nationalist films, some of which were based on Persianate literature, as uh, my colleague showed today, um, and all of which were, of course, filmed in India. His films best demonstrate what Nafisi calls the co-presence of past and presence in the consciousness of filmmakers and spectators in Iranian national cinema. Sepantas, or Ardashir Irani's The Lore Girl, corresponded with official narratives of nationalism. In fact, by the early 1930s, cinema was taken up or co-opted by the state as the government sanctioned the usage of cinema, as I showed in this slide, in schools and commissioned the making of films that portrayed an advanced country or um, uh, an ancient glorious past of Iran. The making of films such as Ferdowsi for the millennial celebrations of the Shahnameh poet in 1934 and Shirin and Farhad based on Nizami's um, Khosran Shirin are noteworthy here. In his books and articles, Nafisi also elaborates on this Culture of, uh, culture of spectacle that Reza Shah also engaged in in the 1930s, namely his visit to Ataturk's Turkey in 1934, which uh, were part and parcel of the state's cinematic love affair. While the beginning of World War II, uh, sorry, with the beginning of uh, World War II, fiction film production in Iran came to a halt. Again, that did not mean that cinema activities were stalled. And I don't know of any other scholar who provides a more comprehensive overview of the documentaries and newsreels that were made and screened by Iranians and non-Iranians during the interwar, uh, interwar and World War II period as, uh, uh, as Nafisi does. As, as he shows us, cinema ownership, film programming, and filmmaking during this period was demonstrative of ethno-religious and multinational connections which had only increased from the early period. Despite challenges during World War II, a popular film industry emerged in the late 1940s, which was arguably an actualization of earlier aspirations for cinematic sovereignty or a national cinema. While painting films with an Iranian color, these popular films drew on global mainstream film narratives, tropes, and characters, and engendered an entertaining cosmopolitan film enterprise. Dubbed negatively as film Farsi to denote their imitation of Hollywood, Egyptian, and Hindi popular cinema, they have for a long time evaded scrutiny and critical examination. And why is that the case? The charges that were aimed at this commercial film industry by cultural critics of post-World War II era were taken up by the intellectuals of post-revolutionary period who studied pre-revolutionary cinema. 
and therefore film Farsi lost its rightful place in the canon of Iranian film industry. Nafisi sharply points out the vehemence in the criticisms of uh, leftist critics in the 1960s who applied the Western or Soviet standards of art cinema and felt embarrassed at the naivete of film Farsi. Nafisi heeds the call by Parviz Davoy to take film Farsi seriously and thus de delineates two main genres in film Farsi, namely the stew pot movies and tough guy movies. Building on this call to take film Farsi seriously, scholars such as uh, Petram Partovi, Simran, um, Kave Askari, Laura Fisher, uh, Claire Cooley, um, and myself have dedicated large sections of our books or our, re our research to this understudied uh, industry to offer alternative accounts about the historical importance of popular films. Extremely popular among the masses, film Farsi, film Farsi arguably untangled Iranian negotiations with rapid modernization and provided a social commentary on societal changes and national debates of the, uh, from the 1950s to 1970s. The pre-revolutionary alternative cinematic movement, also known as New Wave by some scholars, which solidified in the 1960s, continued Iranian popular cinema's tradition of social criticism, albeit in a social, social realist and art house cinematic form. This cinema spoke to left-leaning international critics who were supportive of uh, third world nationalism during this time, and therefore gained attention in local and global film circles. The emergent alternative movement set the conditions for a cinematic revolution which happened prior to the political revolution of 1979. The Iranian revolution of 1979 argu arguably changed the conditions of filmmaking in Iran. Despite the radical changes, however, Cinema has continued its tradition of mediating social criticisms and national debates. Because of its realism and social commitment in the last three decades, I should say four decades, the post-revolutionary alternative cinema has once again gained the attention of international film critics and found a unique place for itself in film festivals. No other scholar has examined the history of Iranian cinema from pre-revolutionary to post-revolutionary eras as exhaustively as Hamid Nafisi. Taking a personal interest in cinema and multimedia visual culture from an early age, Nafisi has come to be known as the authoritative voice on the history of Iranian cinema and television, both national and exilic. Considering his meticulous early work on documentary filmmaking in Iran, literature on Iranian and global exilic television and film production, and his seminal four-volume work on the social history of Iranian cinema, it is impossible to be a student and researcher of cinema or media and not engage with Nafisi's scholarship. And his work as my colleagues have shown today, is not limited, of course, to Iranian cinema, as we saw. Um, his rich, diverse, theoretically rigorous, and interdisciplinary work has uh, found much relevance in, in, film, uh, in fields such as not only Iranian cinema, but of course, communication studies, media studies, post-colonial studies, sociology, and anthropology. The impressive malleability of Nafisi's work could well be demonstrated through the, the transdisciplinary contributions in a special issue that I edited for Iran Nomag in 2018 with uh, uh, Mohammad here. The contributions in the issue dedicated to Hamid Nafisi not only engaged with and built on Nafisi's scholarship and artistic works, but they attested to the necessity of an interdisciplinary interdisciplinary examination of Iranian visual media uh, uh, and culture. The scholarship of Nafisi, like the articles in the special issue, beg for a rethinking of conventional histories of cinema, rejection of grand narratives, and highlighting of particularities in visual culture, moving beyond the history of 
The first, as is common in many cinema accounts, Nafisi's work has paved new avenues for future scholars, as is clear. The Cin Iranian Cinema Digital Compendium, one of the newest projects that Mohammad Tavakoli has undertaken at the University of Toronto, is a testament to the projects that have, in one way or another, implicated Nafisi's scholarship. In fact, many of the in entries that are suggested for the compendium are taken straight out of um, Nafisi's books. And so, Hamid, um, I join my uh, colleagues here. Um, we thank you for your contributions, for your humility, for your personal and academic generosity that you offer to your students, colleagues, friends, and scholars. Thank you, everyone. Thanks. <laughs>